Okay, this is um, the beginning of my series that's going to be an actual series on, on metaphysics. I have um, three, I have this book, a book on, on real essentialism, a book on truth makers, and then a big, huge anthology. So this is going to be going on for a little while. <clears throat> this is going to start... With this, this is a David David I'm Armstrong, uh, a sketch for a systematic metaphysics. Um, when I took my when I took my first metaphysics class, um, this was the first thing I had read. Um, so <clears throat> the reason I'm starting with this is because um, Armstrong. You know, it's he he gives like a systematic idea of his of his idea of all the entities of of metaphysics and what he argues, <clears throat> but he talks about like every single thing really. He talks about all of it. Uh, he has like a chapter for a lot of things like properties, relations, states of affairs, laws of nature, reacting to dispositionalism, particulars, truth makers. Possibility, actuality, necessity, limits, absences, um, the rational disciplines, numbers, classes, time, and mind. Um, most of these, I think, I'll be going. I'll be going over. I'm not, I'm not sure. The first one is properties, and um, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. It's just a one little chapter, but I'm not going to read through the whole thing. I just want to <clears throat> kind of read through the parts that I find to be important because it goes. It, it discusses properties and, and it discusses nominalism, um, as well as you know um, theories of properties, the, the attribute theory and the bundle theory, um, as well as as well as other things. So um, <clears throat> let's begin with properties of objects. Just th such things as colors, shape, temperature, or mass. They will lead us to state states of affairs. Entities that, that that lie at the center of my of my ontology, Russell and Wittgenstein call them facts, and I am simply following in their footsteps with a difference in in terminology. So, properties has have something to do with the state with the state of affairs. Um, it would seem natural to accept the existence of properties. Things are colored in, in particular ways. They have different shapes and sizes. They are hot or cold or in between. They have different weights. Scientific investigation rapidly endorses classifying things by their by their properties. For instance, it takes the the, the common sense property of weight and develops develops the more sophisticated and important property of mass. You weigh less on the moon, but your mass does not change. At a deeper level, at a deeper level, it postulates the property of rest mass. The mass of the body it has when it when it is at rest, as opposed to when it, to what it has when it moves. A very large part of um, empirical science lies in uncovering the properties of things on uncovering that has had the pro the prodigious success <clears throat> okay um, so properties there's a different there's a difference between properties and in particulars particular is uh, for instance this pen here this is a, a particular um, a property for instance would be white um, why, um, and there's various ideas of, we're going to look at properties as, as universal and such, but, uh, white would be a property, um, round or cylindrical would be another, another, another property, you know, um, there's lots of, there's lots of properties for one thing, and I think that I have to, you know, um, Armstrong ascribes to properties. He he argues that that that, that properties exist, um, <clears throat> but it's not always a, an argument for existence. But it's always it's not it's it's always more rather a argument for whether we should be talking about them or not. But I am um, there's um, an, ar an article by G. E. Moore. Um, I'm going to do a reading of that to start my epistemology series. Uh, in introduction of sense data. Um, and in, in that book, or I mean in that article, he holds up a envelope in front of people, and you know if I if you if you are like a teacher and you hold up a envelope an envelope, 
in, in front of your class, a lot, a lot of people spread out. Everybody's going to see a different envelope. You know, everybody's gonna, you know they're still seeing the same envelope, but they're seeing a different part, uh, depending on the light, on the lighting uh, from, from where they're sitting, or, or the lighting from where the teacher is, or you know, uh, or depending on what's inside the, or what the envelope is made of, and the light reflecting it, re reflecting off of it. It's going to give different sense data to, to various people, even though they're, even though you're, you're looking at the same envelope. So I think because of that, like just that alone, for me would <coughs> make properties uh, um, important. So here he um, discusses something called nominalism. Nominalism is the arguments. It's there's four different ones I think he discusses here. For there's are there are there arguments for either the non the non the non existence of properties or um argument for not talking about them. Um, it is the case nevertheless that, that until rather recently many in, in the analytic tradition have been inclined to deny the existence of properties in the world. Deny the existence of properties in right in a Latin phrase that that is often used. This position is is traditionally called nominalism, though the word sometimes bears other senses. We should, we should therefore begin by giving this skeptical view of some, of some attention. There are various types of nominalism, predicate, class, resemblance, and what I call ostrich nominalism. <clears throat> predicate nominalists hold that properties are mere shadows cast by predicates. Um, see John Searle, Searle, 69. Um, he says, to, to, put it, to put it briefly, universals are parasitic on predicate expressions, trying to solve me metaphysical problems by semantic assent, that is, by appealing to language was typical of that, that period. I hope we can pass this, this position by a more in interesting view is class, is class nominalism. <clears throat> John Searle, um, I haven't really read a whole lot of Searle, but <clears throat> John Searle, um, in his work, he would... Uh, have a lot of arguments with respect to, or that, you know, rested on certain uh, doctrines that have to do with, would have to do with semantics and language. Um, predicate nominalism was one of those. <clears throat> and even Armstrong says, I hope, I hope we can pass this, this position by. Um, predicate, predicate nominalists hold that properties are mere, that properties are the mere shadows cast by predicates. Now, predicate... Um, there's in a sentence, there's a subject, and there's a predicate. Um, so that's what that would mean. It's, it's just mere um, semantics. Um, class nominalism. To have the property of whiteness is to be a member of the class of white things. This is a set theoretical treatment of properties. The really interesting question that then arises is whether every class of object constitutes a property, even if it is a property that we have no name for, no use for, and no interest in. That would be a thoroughgoing class nominalism, but, but at the same time it is rather implausible. David Lewis held, held, held that view at one time, see his paper, New Work for a Theory of, the, of, of Universals in 1999. First note, first, first note, note of his paper credits me with changing my, his mind on this matter. He says that otherwise I might well have believed to this day. That set theory. That set theory applied to possibilia. David Lewis had the <clears throat> he had this this metaphysics of possible worlds, and that is very interesting. And I want, I think that in that in that anthology I have over there, there's some work on David Lewis in there. <coughs> but class nominalism um, is pretty much set a set theoretic. It's that. Everything that's white is, is a part of a class of whiteness. But, um, I don't know. Lewis speaks of possibility here instead of particulars, as one might expect, because he holds that, that the beings of every possible world exist. In this paper, Lewis calls, also, calls, also calls, calls attention to quiet, equally strange view that to introduce classes is to platonize. Uh, platonize is to postulate non spatial temporal entities such as, as, as the forms, and so to, and to, so to abandon nominalism. Quine is awesome, I must say. Um, 
I have to I have to, I have to agree about that because I think that it's just kind of um, avoiding the problem if you're trying to get away from properties if you're not you're not really avoiding it if you're if you're gonna postulate classes <clears throat> and doing this plate this platonism is abandoning novelism. Uh, this is because Quinn thought that classes are abstract entities, which they are. Whiteness having a class of of, 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 of everything white, that is a form. It's uh, uh, universal. Um, it's, it's part of the abstracta. Because Keith Quinn thought that the classes are abstract entities. Outside space time, I see no reason to think that the classes are abstract entities. That there are members that don't exist. There's abstract, you know, that would postulate those. <clears throat> yeah, this is a big, um, interesting thing here. Um, a class theory of property is delayed nominalism. Let's agree, then, that some classes are better than others. We might, might, we might call the better ones property classes. What, what analysis will call the class nominalists give such, what analysis will the class nominalists give of such, such classes? One line to take is that the, is it that the distinction is primitive. Some, some classes are better than others. And that is all that, that can, be, can be said. Though the class theorists, theorists would, would, would presumably allow distinctions in, in a degree, in a degree of betterness. Lewis thought to the end of his life that this sort of class nominalism was an option, though he also thought tropes and universals were, were options also. He made, no, he made no, no decision about which of the three he used to back. Uh, tropes are... Um, Something I will talk about soon. I think I have a video somewhere in my, in my metaphysics playlist about that says some, something about tropes. <clears throat> um, a third position, a property, a third position, a property anomalous can embrace is to take resemblance of degrees of resemblance holding between particulars as primitives. And then to suggest that, there, that the class of white things, say, is constituted by the resemblances that hold between the, the members of the class. This is not quite an intentional theory, but it starts to work um, away from the ex extensional theories. On this view, class members are linked to each other uh, by the relation of resemblance, which creates a unity and virtue of which the, the members are said to have the same property. The um, aristocratic resemblance in theory sets up one or more paradigm objects to which the, the other members of the class approximate in resemblance. In my opinion, this is a superior brand of property nominalism. It is the, the, the position taken by John Locke, although he did, he did, he did not work out the, 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 the details very far, but it is, it is exposed to various difficulties. In my book, Nominalism and Realism, I assemble all the arguments that have traditionally been advanced against, against resemblance nominalism. So, <clears throat> resemblance nominalism. A third proposition, a third, third position a property, property nominalist can embrace is to take resemblance and degrees of resemblance holding between particulars as primitives. And then to suggest that if they have a class of white things, it's constituted by the resemblances that hold between the, the members of the, of the class. That's a little bit. That's that's actually pretty, not 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 a bad. It's actually pretty arguable. <clears throat> all right, so all the arguments that have, that have traditionally been, been advanced against resemblance nominalism, thinking that after a recital of these, these arguments, I did, I did not have to bother too much about about this theory. How wrong I was. A younger Argent Argentinian philosopher, Gonzalo Rodri 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 Rodriguez Pereira, set out in his doctoral dissertation at Cambridge to show that the, that the arguments could be met. He, large, he, large, he largely succeeded. For those f familiar with Dan Bennett's phil philosophical lexicon available on the net and full of good, good, good philosophy jokes, he exhumed a position previously thought humed. Rodriguez Pereira's book, is a wonderful exposition of exhuming, although later chapters are very complex. But here are two further objections to his theory. Um, as he says himself, he seems to need a realistic view of possible worlds to answer a difficulty about the coexistence of properties, that is, properties with the, with the very same extension. How is a resemblance theory 
is to separate them. Furthermore, he needs rather a precise theory of resemblance, which for which for him come to units units of of, of resemblance. This is a, this is a difficulty I think because re resemblance in practice seems a messy and inexact notion. Uh, the final not anomalous, anomalous position um, demands that the, 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 the demands consideration is what I call ostrich anomalism. See the debate between Mike, Michael DeVitt and myself. Um, the idea is that one needs no theory properties at all, and so one can ignore the whole sh the whole dispute. DeVitt does not quite embrace th this position, but, he, but but makes it clear that he would like to get rid of attributes prop attributes or properties. So ostrich nominalism um, is that the idea that no one is that one needs no theory of properties at all so that one can ignore the whole dispute. If one rejects all these views, as I do, Armstrong does, we are committed to, to there being properties. It is a very natural postulate to make. Consider a certain billiard ball. It has, it has a certain mass and it has a certain color. It may be in motion or, or address on the table. So, so metaphysician seemed, seems to be on solid ground in postulating objective properties of mass, surface color, address, or motion. Truthmaker arguments are, are quite strong here. These properties all, all, all appear to be intrinsic, non-relational. Non -relational. To have nothing but, but the ball itself being a truthmaker, for both the ball is red and the, the ball is spherical, and so on, seems rather plausible. It is certainly very un undiscriminating. Okay, so I guess I want to th I want to think about that um, ostrich nihilism. Why would why would we not need that? I think it. I mean, why why would we not need it? I mean, there would have to be some big reason why of uh, why you wouldn't need that. The that ostrich that ostrich nihilism is actually probably the most interesting one to me um, because I mean it's really. What 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 you'd have to do is have you you have to you have to explain why you why we don't need it, why we don't need any theories at all. Um, there there are further positive arguments that that seem to make the case for it for for introducing properties quite strong. Consider the apparently necessary truths. One red red, red resembles orange more than than it than it, than it resembles blue. Two red is a color. Oh wait. I don't think I wrote this. Um, he he argues here that we should that we should accept properties into our ontology. Um, then then there's an issue between attribute theories and bundle theories. Bundle theories, to, to take them first, are so enamored of properties that that the particulars. Ordinary things are held to be bundles of properties. Um, consider all the properties of a, of a, of a billiard ball. On, the, on a bundle view of, of on the on a bundle view, the billiard ball is just all of its properties bundled together by a relation that it is often called compresence. You can have bundles of universal. The theory adopted by Russell, though only in his later years, he did not get ma many followers for this view. Or you can have bundles of tropes. The classic, though. Not, not the first bu bundle of tropes theory is the great essay by the Harvard philosopher Donald Williams. Um, bundle theories make properties the only fundamental constituents con 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 of particulars, but attribute theorists, I am among them, hold, hold that there are particulars that have the properties properties are attributes of, of, of particulars. Um, it is sometimes thought that attribute theorists are saddled with a Lockean substance, in, in John Locke's words, something we know not what. That is not that, that is not correct at all. I think we are just as aware, say, in perception of the particularity of things, the, and the this and the that, as we are aware of some of, of, the, of the properties of things. We, we perceive that the, the ball, a, a particular, is spherical and red. Particularity, I think, is a fundamental metaphysical category that can't be analyzed away, and it is given to us in experience. Okay, so I guess for me, the bundle theory, I think it doesn't really um, work very well for me. I guess the attribute theory would, would be better.
Um, let's see what else. Now I will argue for something more controversial, but central to my thinking. I maintain that all properties are instantiated. That is to say, a property must be a property of a, of a particular. Properties don't have to be instantiated now, past, or, f or future is enough. They must be instantiated somewhere, some when. Uh, okay. So that, I think, is probably the best idea if, if you're going to hold, the, if you're going to put properties into your, into your, into your ontology. Um, it has to so happen um, that if you're going to have some kind, of, some kind of properties that there's, on, of, of, a certain, of a certain particular, there's, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on, properties instantiated in that, in that, in that object. And that leads to, you know, the question of, of, of universals and such. Um, and tropes as to what, you know, there's tropes and there's, and there's universals and there's other ideas of what these properties really are. And, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to, if we're going to appeal to a, to a Platonistic abstracta or if we're going to um, do something else like go out on the, go out on the trope roll or what. Um, so that's very interesting. The idea here is to really is just to really introduce the introduce the issues and ideas of properties. Um, and I think I got all I wanted to get here. Um, that is all I, that is all I wanted to get here in this chapter. Um, like I said, I have a lot more to come. Um, this was just I wanted to discuss theories of properties in your ontology and theories of nominalism taking properties out of your ontology um, as well as some other things there too. Um, if you have any questions uh, feel free to ask. Um, if you go on my channel page uh, there's a little header that has like my little blue spectacles things. There's a little Twitter thing on the lower right corner if you click on that, that'll that'll take me to that that'll take you to my Twitter, and you can ask me anything there, or or whatever, uh, or you can you YouTube message me or comment or whatever. So I just I I'm trying to introduce this stuff um, because by way of using Armstrong's nice work.